started. Awesome. Cool. Um, hey, everyone. Um, welcome to tonight's uh, collaborative event between um, Tulane's Campus Health and the Office for Gender and Sexual Diversity. Um, we have a phenomenal panel tonight, um, which we've titled Trans Liberation, Accessing QT Healthcare. Um, and this event really came about um, as a collaboration with Body Respect Week, which is going on this week through the Campus Health Office. Um, with some of the specific tenets, one of which is focusing on um, for each day of the week is my body deserves to be treated with dignity and respect. Um, and with really intentional programming with our office, we really wanted um, to create a panel for our um, queer and trans student faculty and staff and any New Orleans community members to access that brings together some of the really phenomenal providers across the city of New Orleans serving the queer and trans community. Um, I think, you know, just speaking for myself, coming from um, a former um, location in more rural Midwest to a city that has a lot more services to provide, um, I was just really excited to be part of a team to get all of you wonderful providers together just to talk about how you're serving the New Orleans queer and trans communities um, overall. Um, we also, through OGSD this spring, uh, this event is part of our overall series of Audre Lorde Days programs and events, so we will drop some links in the chat um, throughout the next hour to a lot of other programming um, that is part of Body Respect Week as well as Sex Week coming up later in the spring and the rest of Audrey Lord days. Um, but we have a, a robust full panel this evening. So I am going to introduce our wonderful moderator for tonight, uh, Theo Matherin. Uh, Theo uh, is currently the chair of the Queer Student Alliance, QSA for short. Um, they are a student ambassador for the Office for Gender and Sexual Diversity, and she is also a Kaleidoscope um, Learning Community alumni, as well as a community engagement advocate here on campus. So I'm going to turn it over to Theo. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for the lovely introduction. Um, so to get us started, I'm going to give the panelists an opportunity to introduce themselves with their name, pronouns, positions, and where they work. And from there, we'll go into a couple uh, pre-done questions. And as audience questions roll in, I will also be giving those out to the panelists. And the panelists can introduce themselves as they're ready. I'll go first. I'm Catherine Alvirock. I use she, her, hers pronouns. Um, I'm one of the internal medicine, medicine physicians at Tulane Student Health Center. And I'm Andrew Davenport, um, pronouns he, him, his. And I also work at Tulane Student Health Center and I'm a nurse practitioner. Uh, I'm Danny Archie and he, him pronouns. Uh, and I'm a staff psychologist at Tulane's Counseling Center. I'm Janaki Flint, she, her pronouns, and I'm also a staff psychologist at the Tulane Counseling Center. Hi everyone, I'm Deepa Panchong. I'm a family nurse practitioner. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and I work at Crescent Care uh, Community Health Center. Hey y'all, my name is Logan. Uh, I'm he, him pronouns, and I'm the clinical coordinator for Crescent Cares Trans Health Services um, and also in nurse practitioner school at Simmons University, which is Drew's alumni. Shout out to Simmons. I'm happy to be here. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Clifton Mixon, and I use he, him pronouns. Um, I work as a psychologist in Oshner's Gender Affirmation Clinic over at their Chapatulis location. Um, thank you for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here. Okay, was that everyone? Yes, perfect. All right, so to get us started, I would love it if all of the panelists could actually elaborate on um, kind of what you do and how your position and experiences specifically serve queer and trans communities and queer and trans youth. I guess I'll start off again. Um, so I'm one of the physicians here and our, our student health center, um, we do a really wide array of clinical services, but I am one of our providers who um, has an interest in um, sees patients for gender affirming care. We, we have quite a few services that we do offer. Um, we, you know, 
have conversations and initiate and manage hormone therapy, make referrals as, as desire indicated, and um, you know, collaborate with outside physicians or specialists as needed. Um, really, whatever services students need or desire, we're happy to help facilitate. And if we don't have the service, we're happy to try and make connections in the community um, where, where someone might be best served. Oops, sorry, so I'll go next. Um, so basically just restating what uh, Dr. Alborak said. Um, I've previously worked at other places as well as a nurse and a public health provider um, at Crescent Care and many other community health centers. And I've worked at, their at Crescent Care's transgender clinic, um, the prep clinic, those sorts of things. So I have an array of public health experience. And if we don't know what what to do for you basically at the student health center we can definitely refer you somewhere to help find you someone that can help you out so i'll go um so at the counseling center we have a kind of variety of services for students we offer both individual and group therapy um, in particular, we do have one therapy group that is specific for queer and trans students, um, but we also have other groups that are maybe specific to anxiety or um, other procrastination, other issues like that. Um, I see a, a, you know, a number of queer and trans students, but I also do training for staff. So I've done um, two different trainings for all of our therapists here on working with uh, trans and non-binary individuals. So kind of everyone over here has some kind of basics, basis in that. Um, and I also kind of consult with uh, our therapists when needed in that realm. Um, I also serve as the gender and sexual diversity advocate. Um, and part of that role is, is to kind of offer um, community engagement, outreach services across campus. So I'm available to kind of do a lot of different uh, types of kind of talks or lead discussions or um, different things like that for students as needed. Um, and so that's kind of some of the, the roles that I feel here. I forgot one more thing is we also do have someone who is a uh, called a care coordinator. And so if we, you know, our services aren't appropriate for you, we do have someone who can um, get you set up with therapists in the community. And so that's also uh, something we do. And then also I have written letters for that are needed for hormone replacement therapy, as well as um, gender affirming surgery. So that is something that we can do here at the counseling center, um, and which is especially nice because a lot of times therapists end up charging for things like that. So um, that's not, we don't charge for that. So that's something that, that's really nice to have on campus. I'll go next. Um, so uh, like I said earlier, I'm the clinical care coordinator for uh, Crescent Care's gender services. Um, I'm also a founding member of Crescent Care's trans advisory committee, which we developed about four years ago. Um, I was a case manager when I first uh, started at Crescent Care, um, but we decided that our gender affirming care really needed some improvements. Um, and we really had, um, we only had like a couple providers who felt comfortable with hormone therapy. Um, and so we developed a gender clinic, which started as one designated day with one provider where we would open the schedule and see, you know, just people of trans experience start hormones, um, really started as just an access point, uh, first and foremost, and that's expanded exponentially um, over the last three and a half years. Um, we've expanded to like four or five providers, some who have left, some of the new ones who have come on. Um, and now um, our work is trying to embed uh, hormone therapy into the things into primary care within Crescent Care, um, which uh, one of our wonderful providers is Deepa. <laughs> Um, and so, and we were like siloing our services a bit where we're trying to expand it, um, expand it out. And we pulled some data um, a couple months ago that showed that we've served over 1300 people of trans experience since we started the gender clinic. So that's really exciting. Um, and I think that Crescent Care is going to continue to do that work. Um, right now we are, on, we have some staffing uh, shortages um, with providers who are able to initiate hormones right now. So. Um, we're having some shifting there, but so we're, we've temporarily closed our, um, we're not able to take new patients who are hormone naive or never been on hormone therapy for right now. 
Um, but we foresee that um, in a couple months, we'll be able to open back up um, with some additional staffing with patient navigators and et cetera, um, and new providers. So excited about that. Um, I'll jump off of that since you know, I'm, I'm one of the providers at Crescent Care who does do um, gender affirming care. And I mean, just a little context on Crescent Care, we were, we started as a very small nonprofit that kind of grew out of the HIV AIDS movement in the 80s. And so Crescent Care has kind of always been very embedded in the queer community here. Um, and as time goes on, has gone, has gone on, there's been efforts to kind of just expand that, like Logan said, um, working more, you know, doing more advocacy for transgender folks and making sure that we're reaching more diverse um, patient population. Um, and we're, we're also kind of in this process right now of strengthening the anti-racist framework that we work out of um, and making sure that we're a really safe space for queer trans people of color. Um, so yeah, like Logan said, we're kind of working to embed more of our gender care within primary care in general and just offer care that is queer affirming so that people don't necessarily feel like they have to access need two different access points for their gender care and for their primary care. Um, and then we do have behavioral health services as well. So we have counseling and psychiatry. Um, and we do a lot of sexual health work as well. So we offer um, PrEP services, HIV prevention, PEP and things like that. Um, and then one important factor is also that we're, we do do a lot of advocacy um, just to kind of push queer and trans issues on a local and national scale whenever we see those you know legislative barriers um kind of interfering with the care that people can receive so that's something that we see as really important as well um i can go next so um, my role kind of at Oshner is that of a child and adolescent psychologist in our gender affirming clinic so i work with our pediatric endocrinologist to kind of work with kids and families as they come in for what kind of whatever needs they have whether they're purely looking for behavioral health support more often than not it's kids coming in who would like some kind of medical intervention to transition and so my role is really to help educate the parents and help them better understand their child so they can support them in a way that is affirming um, and, you know, if there's additional behavioral health needs above and beyond kind of just what you would expect with that role, kind of connecting them with gender affirming providers, um, either at Oshner or elsewhere in the community. Um, but our clinic's a lot larger than me, so we do have an adult component that's our adult endocrinologist, Dr. Brandy Penunti, um, who's been serving the community for quite some time. Um, we're integrating um, into our clinic some other specialists that are, that are important in queer and trans care, including a, a primary care physician, Dr. Robin Avester, who does prep services, as well as his expertise in gender affirming care. Um, they really do some great work, and we're very excited to have them in our clinic this upcoming starting in March. Um, we, our voice center has become integrated with our clinic, sometimes coming to clinic to meet patients, and, and we're working out a favorable payer payer situation just because that kind of voice training unfortunately is not covered by insurance so we're working to see how we can maybe provide some scholarships um, we have a lot of support from um, our other services eventually we would like uh, urology and gynecological care to be integrated with our clinic um, but we have a lot of, of, of providers who are expert in the different subspecialists that our patients need to intersect with um, and have access to that care throughout the system whether it be gynecological care, surgical services, um, affirming um, uh, primary care with PrEP, um, and then behavioral health providers who are expert in, in that care. Um, I, I think Ashna has also just done a lot to try and make the whole system pretty affirming. Um, this year, we received uh, HEI 100% designation for all of our clinics. Um, and, and we're doing a lot of work to, to tackle both diversity within Oshner and then in, in terms of how we, we provide care to our patients and just trying to leverage the resources we have. Um, we have a great philanthropy department um, who's working with our gender clinic to see how we make, maybe can connect with community partners to uplift them in the queer community um, and, and leveraging some of our uh, connections with the legislature to work against some of the um, unfortunate legislation that's been coming up in recent years. Um, so, so quite the array of services. I'm, I'm happy to talk about any of them individually. We are dropping um, a lot of links in the chat 
um, to information and links to the bios of our panelists, as well as links to the different resources and context and histories of the um, organizations that they're at. All right, thank you everyone so much for your answers. Moving on to the next question. Um, from your perspective as the healthcare provider, rather than looking at it from the patient perspective, because you guys have a little more insight into really what's the going ons of our in the medical field, what would you consider to be the most difficult aspect of navigating trans healthcare, queer and trans healthcare? Um, I'll go. I'll answer that. Um, there's a few things. Um, you know, especially at Crescent Care, we serve a lot of um, people who are like lower socioeconomic status, a lot of Medicaid recipients, people who are on sliding scale. Um, and as you know, like healthcare access, um, you know, we, we're, we have a capitalist healthcare system, so everything is like money driven. Um, and there's low resources for people, especially around transportation. Um, people are often late or don't show up for their appointments because they can't get a ride. Medicaid transportation is unreliable. Um, or they have to work or they have childcare issues or whatever the case is. Um, so access just to get into the clinic. Um, and now that we're expanded into telehealth, that's e also access around um, internet access, smartphone access, anything that connects you to your provider in, in a digital world. Um, the other bigger thing um, is we can make gender affirming, like we can have a clinic that has gender affirming primary care all day, but if we don't also have gender affirming specialists, we can't really serve people. And so, you know, if I, but I, as a nurse practitioner, um, you know, are seeing somebody for primary care and they, they need um, cardiology, they need neurology, they need dermatology or whatever the case is, we often send our patients over to providers who don't have the, the knowledge to serve them um, and, their, and their experiences. And so they come back and they're like, I'm not going back to that provider. And then you end up kind of maybe sometimes even working outside of like what you're comfortable with in your scope of practice because you don't have allies. And people, um, a lot of people, when I'm, I'm out as trans with in my uh, program, and so a lot of other nurse practitioner students ask me like, what, what good can I do for trans people as somebody who's going into neurology, for instance? And I was like, just being a person who understands the trans, like it, basically the trans experience and comes, meets people with compassion. So people often like write off, like I can't be, be helpful or important um, in these other roles. And I think um, in integrating those, that, those education points into um, like medical schools and nursing schools and, and middle provider programs um, are super important. Um, and I, and that, that work it has to be done by everybody who's in healthcare and cert, like looking to go into healthcare. I really echo a lot of your, your sentiments. Um, I've done a lot of, of self-education. I definitely in medical school, this is not a field that is robustly taught. Um, and with us at Campus Health, we don't, we don't have subspecialists as part of our practice. And sometimes it does feel a little bit siloed. And I am not afraid at all to ask for help from someone who knows more than me when I've kind of reached the limit of my knowledge. Um, but I think, I think sometimes that is hard for, for providers and knowing who to turn to if um, maybe you do run into a challenge and it's, it's really nice to have everyone from these different institutions in this panel so that we can kind of know each other and, and know other people that we can maybe work with in the community, um, especially for us and, and for our students um, to know, know we have some allies in the community as well. But I think that's also one of the biggest challenges that I faced as well. And I think to kind of ex expand on that, like I think in particular, one of the areas that is the hardest um, is if there's a kind of urgent emergent issue. Um, so if you're going to the ER, either for a, a physical medical issue or a mental health, um, because you're already in a very, very vulnerable state um, and you have no idea if the providers you're talking to are going to be uh, equipped to work with you. And so, um, you know, speaking on that is both from like a person of trans experience and a provider. I think that's that's kind of a, a big area that um, is a is an issue in, in trans and queer health. Um, and so, one thing I always suggest for people is um, having someone come with you um, when you have to be in a place. And even if it's you know you you feel like you don't really know 
that you want anyone in your business, but like having someone there who can advocate for you when you're at the, a place where you're not able to can make all the difference. You know, having someone who can correct your doctors when they're misgendering you because it just, it's exhausting to do that, right? And so um, I think that's a huge thing to do um, when, it, when you do have those kind of emergencies is um, kind of have someone have your back. But, but I think that's a, that's a huge barrier and, and issue. I think some of the pressure points we really feel that can be a little frustrating or some that I think everyone here probably feels is just, you know, some of the way the health system is send, set up and the way certain services are covered or not uh, in a very unequitable way. Um, it requires sometimes a lot of fighting and negotiation with the insurance company, but then also just with the formulary with our pharmacy for making exceptions that, that, that really shouldn't have to be exceptions because we use these same medications for other populations. Um, also kind of just the context of these restrictions that I think people feel that they have to, that they can put on other people's bodies as a society with all these laws that come up, it just makes it really hard because you can do all this great work to support, to support a patient and kind of help them develop coping skills and develop the support system. And it really just takes a lot of poorly informed or malintentioned people to, to really cause crises that that you've worked hard to try and build resilience against and, and it just keeps coming and, and it's just, it's very frustrating. Um, I think at Ostra, one of the, the, the things that's been a challenge for me is just that a bigger system, as you identify pressure points and things that need to change, it takes time <laughs> and all too slow. Like we're currently working for our EMR, our electronic medical record to be able to include pronouns that are visible for every single provider as soon as they open the chart. And you know we were supposed to have an update last week. It hasn't happened yet. Working on getting prefer uh, act of ch chosen name um, and pronouns printed on labels and, and wristbands so that when someone's coming in for for you know some kind of procedure, they're not being misgendered. And just there's just so much red tape. I think to to, to fix it in a big system like this, they can just it takes time. Everyone's well intentioned, but it definitely takes some time. Thank you, everyone. Those were really good responses and definitely provided kind of a lot of insight into what goes on behind the scenes. Um, with the advent of medical services like uh, Folks Health, which for those who are unfamiliar, is a rapidly expanding like mail service that can actually provide HRT. Um, I don't know all of the details of how it works, but I know that like a lot of these more uh, smaller endeavors are trying to prop up in as a way to make queer and trans healthcare more accessible, how do you see uh, healthcare changing in the future with the advent of these new methods? Well, I think that one of the like silver linings of, of the pandemic itself is, is really the expansion of telehealth. And I think that's especially important in um, for queer and trans people who live in rural areas um, because a lot of times there might be one provider in the whole state who, who does HRT, you know, and uh, having to travel three, four hours um, can be really difficult. And so I think, and, in, and with mental health care, um, again, I think that a lot of mental health professionals, you know, um, are in certain places, but that those, the ones out in the, the rural areas may not be as trans affirming or as trained in those issues. And so being able to see a therapist um, as we're doing now, because we're forced to, um, but, you know, I think that this will carry on after the pandemic, um, and I think that's a real um, a benefit for queer and trans people. I, want, I ultimately want people to have options. I think that, um, you know, we shouldn't have, like, we shouldn't be the one, one in town that you go to, right? Like, uh, I, I want people to have options, and, you know, some people like telehealth, some people don't. They want that more personable in-person experience. I know that there are some limitations to telehealth in terms of like how safely we can take care of people. Um, you know, I can't deal, I can't help somebody who's, who has abdominal pain really without a physical exam, right? So, you know, there are some limitations. Um, I think in terms of like just hormone therapy, you know, things like Plume and folks that you were talking about um, are great. Um, you know, and I think they're like, um, you know, a monthly subscription service type thing and you kind of get the telehealth and the labs and all that included. Um, and it's low barrier, which I really like. Um, I think we should just make sure that, you know, we're being safe um, in how we practice and that we're taking care of the whole person um, and not just like pigeonholing them as people who need hormone therapy um, because they're whole people who need primary care and other things. So 
Um, but I, I'm really happy to see those things and I hope that they keep continue to expand, especially like uh, Danny said, in like rural areas where, um, you know, we're often the only, you have to tra travel to a big city to get the care you need. Yeah, and I think, I think one of the added benefits that we're seeing um, that was mentioned with COVID is that we have doing, doing telehealth for people in rural areas who have been able to access either nothing or very poor um, gender affirming care. And I think in a way, we can kind of be a part of pushing the healthcare in those areas to get up to speed in a certain way, because if their patients can come to us, like maybe two, three hours away, and get actual gender affirming care um, and they're going away from those clinics, I think that it actually is kind of a wake up call um, to some of the clinics and providers in those areas to, to kind of update their services. Um, so I think that's kind of one of the added benefits. I would really like to see the expansion of like a, a consultation service, like a telehealth consultation service. So some of those more you know, less experienced rural practitioners can access, um, you know, people who have more breadth of experience. There's actually a really great um, resource, Transline, for, for providers. I don't know if you all have tapped into that. They have, um, they have guidelines of, uh, for hormone therapy. They also have a um, question and answer service where a provider will respond to you within like 48 hours generally um, of a question that you may have. Um, it's a great service. I hope that things like that expand so that we can you know, not again, silo our expertise and be able to share that so other people can can take care of people too. I'm dropping the trans line link in the chat. Great, okay, moving on to our next question. Um, on especially with the recent change in our administration and now being under the Biden administration, uh, do you foresee any possible changes in like policies and like on the legal side of medical care under this new administration? That's a, I think that's a tough question because I think we can see, I think we'll see from the Biden administration with the, 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 the choices he's made from his choices for cabinet members, his initial hundred, you know, his first executive orders he's signing, you know, he, he's really positioning himself to be a real advocate to the queer and trans community. And I think that we'll see him affirm the federal government's role in this, but we also have the, the, consequential backlash that comes from big policy changes like that, um, such as we saw in, in, in the landmark Obergefell case that just inspired this proliferation of anti-trans legislation across the country and state legislatures. Even, even here in Louisiana, we saw last year that someone had introduced kind of anti-youth sports bill and then it was taken off the docket because things were prioritized due to COVID, but our neighbor in Mississippi has legislation that would restrict access for individuals 21 and under. Um, and, and, and it's hard to really enforce those federal, you know, executive orders until there's some kind of challenge to the state law and someone has to sue. So we're gonna have these responses in states that can actually probably do more harm than some of the federal protections can do good initially. So I think it will be a little bit of a mixed bag that the good intentions there but then you have people who, who seem to really focus for some reason on trying to legislate trans bodies and actions, um, really try and get very vocal and make a push in, their, in what I consider the wrong direction. So um, I think we'll see some very good things, but also worries me what the counter response is gonna be. Thank you so much. Um, oh, did you want to go? Yeah, I was. I was also going to say, you know, I, I think another thing to be seen is is um, how the Biden administration is going to handle health insurance, um, and so I think that's another huge issue um, for in a lot of ways. For one, if you don't have health insurance or you uh, don't have good health insurance, it's hard to access any care at all. 
Um, but then also, you know, I think insurers have done different things to exclude trans healthcare and they do it in lots of different ways, which means providers have to be really very um, knowledgeable and creative of how to get around those things and the good providers do that. But um, I think that that's also another thing that um, is an important thing that uh, needs to be addressed. Thank you both. Um, on, for our next question, we have, what does gender euphoria and gender liberation look like in healthcare? I'll speak for like mental health care. I think that um, sometimes the therapy room is the first and for a while the only place that a person is able to be themselves um, fully. And I think that like being able to share that experience with someone I think is really, really meaningful and, and something I really value uh, when working with my trans clients is, is, you know, again, before they're ready to come out and even maybe before ready of really understanding what, what their identity is as they're kind of working through it, um, having that space where there is no judgment, it's safe to do that. And there's not, you know, this risk of, well, if I try this out and I end up, it ends up, ends up not fitting for me, what are all my friends gonna think, right? Um, and so it's a place to kind of explore. And so I think that that is where a lot of gender euphoria can happen for some people, um, not everyone, um, but I think for some people that's, that's those first experiences can be in that place. I'll, I'll say I see a lot of gender euphoria when when kids show up to their appointment and I'm usually the first person they meet. And for some of them, they might have been pushing for a long time to get to this clinic. And for some of them, they, you know, I actually had someone in December who didn't know which, which doctor's appointment she was going to. And at some point she looked at me, she's like, wait, it, is this it? Is this where I get estrogen I like she hadn't quite processed fully and you just like see this huge weight because a lot of them have been working and working their parents down and doing the hard work of trying to change the people around them to better understand and see them and a lot of them have been afraid to ask for these things and a lot of them have been you know just had a really rough road of it and to finally be at a place where they feel like they're at least making steps in the process you see a lot of euphoria um a lot and I think that's just I think one of the things that keeps me going and 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 is just so um rewarding to see taking kind of like a forward looking view on that question I mean I think a lot about how much um I operate as a gatekeeper and I don't want to. And I think a lot of us, I mean, we probably all feel that way, the providers on this panel. Um, I see that role as like inherently problematic. Um, and I see like a huge part of what I try to do is to try to whittle down that gatekeeper barrier between patients and the life that they're trying to live. Um, and I think in terms of gender liberation, I would love to see that like whittled down more and more and more. So my only role would be just kind of supporting someone in that process that they are on, maybe helping them do it safely. That's and that's about it. But having everything else kind of there available for them. Um, and I would, I would, I just love like I. That's what I think about when I think about gender liberation and healthcare. Like I just, I would love to just get rid of that whole gatekeeper concept. I love that deep. I was going to say something similar just to jump off from that. Like, I think as, as providers, we also have to challenge our own like gender bias and our own like, like bias about normative bodies and stop pathologizing people who like, you know, don't fit within this mold. I mean, historically, like, like access to trans health was all about like, um, going to a mental health provider, like being able to demonstrate that you uh, identify or are living in this particular binary gender and that that is like true to life for you. And mm -hmm go to another provider, like display this proof in this form of a letter and say, you know, and the provider's like, well, I guess I feel comfortable enough to like do this thing that, you know, in this, and give you these things. 
And so like that pigeonholes people into binary identities that they, may, they, did, they don't hold. And so this whole idea of like trans regret, I think is largely around people who were forced into a binary identity, forced to medically transition towards that particular binary, and then felt, you know, like that didn't fit them either, because that, that's not where their gender exists, you know, they're, they're more expansive than that. And so, um, you know, I think as one of the things that I'm like constantly doing is like, trying to meet people where they are in their own ex identity and, and, ex and experience within their bodies and be like, what are your goals? Like outside of like, this is my job to educate somebody on like what our, like what science can do, right? Like within a safe um, range, like what will this hormone offer you in terms of changes or, or and how does that align with your particular goals? Um, and, you know, our, our whole job is to inform and, and keep people safe and you know, um, I think if we keep that in mind and then like continuously unpack our own biases, um, you know, we'll be able to reach gender liberation. And hopefully I aspire for a day when like gender care is just a part of like primary care, <laughs> like, um, and we don't have to, we don't have to go to a particular doctor to get these things, you know. I think part of how we get to, I guess, gender liberation in the healthcare system is, you know, everyone here, I think, has similar shared goals and interests, but a lot of it comes at educating our colleagues and kind of pushing on them to kind of expand their what, what they know, what they're interested in knowing, what they're willing to know, and how they think about, like, their role in healthcare. And some of that is being willing to, to, to kind of, you know, sometimes hold the line on what I believe when other providers are like, well, you give hormones to kids? Like, like how would that, and then they start kind of asking problematic questions and some of them are much further along than you in their career and just being willing to kind of push other people out of their comfort zone to, to, to start to come into the fold of thinking a little bit more like how we do um, and, and creating a world where people don't have to think about which doctor do they go to? Am I gonna find a doctor who's supportive um, and affirming? Um, now it'll take some time, but we've got a lot of us here to do it. Take the lead from that. I think that just in different settings where I've worked, I've had a lot of colleagues who are very interested and would love to be involved and just don't feel comfortable from maybe an education standpoint and they don't know where to start to kind of grow, grow their comfort and don't have someone that they can go to, to learn from. So um, I guess kind of moving forward, I would hope we all support each other to be able to, to offer more expansive care um, and encourage our colleagues who maybe do have some desire, but don't know, don't know where to go from where they are. Um, I mean, I, I think that would be nice moving forward. I think another part of trans liberation that is um, in healthcare is, is you know, we, we know the health disparities that trans people face, especially trans people of color and um, people who have other kind of marginalized identities. And so I think getting to the place where being trans doesn't kind of make you so vulnerable that you're experiencing all these other health issues, that would be amazing where we're not needed as often, right? That would be great. Um, what we're needed for is to, again, like just to care for you and your basic health, but not all these extra health issues and mental health issues that come with the minority stress that it, it exists from just existing as trans in our culture. And so um, I think that that's also kind of something I would love to see um, in our future. And I would just like to add, I was, talking with some other providers in our little provider room earlier and I asked who actually in here had any kind of trans education in their programs and I was literally the only one and I got like maybe a week's worth of LGBTQ help so I would say that that program's in Boston it's a little more you know liberal the schools are more open-minded there so I think there is trickling down effect of that coming later on. So I think there will be people that get more education in their programs and it branches out eventually, hopefully. Yeah, and I, I know I'm not a panelist, but from uh, the student affairs side, I'm working with a lot, uh, working at four different universities with their medical schools often around like queer and trans inclusion. Um, I just want to honor all of the 
queer and trans, specifically QT BIPOC, like medical school students, nursing students, social work students who've gone through these programs and always fought for that curriculum to be updated. And it's usually those students like demanding it or having right to suffer through even still today, right? Um, in the programs here at Tulane, right? And other, any other university I've worked at too. Again, it's always finally getting even that access to higher education, um, let alone what is that process, um, especially to be taught about identities you hold in such really harmful, outdated, and really through the base of eugenics a lot of times, right? That we don't unpack or talk about, right? Um, so just like really honoring that, like you all as folks who've gone through those systems, right? And where you are today and what you're doing and also the current students really fighting for that curriculum and to have access to being taught like, like deeply competent, right? And humility um, and, and serving marginalized populations. All right, and for our final question of the evening, um, do you have any advice regarding self-advocacy as a patient, both in terms of identity, but also making sure that whoever you're speaking with is listening and understanding um, what you're going through and that like kind of as that patient, you do understand to up to a certain extent what is happening in your body. I'll say in the mental health field, a couple of things. I think one, um, on the front end, doing some, some work to find a, a therapist who is gonna be trans affirming and has experience um, is, is one thing you can do to advocate yourself. So kind of put yourself in a room that's gonna work for you. I think another thing is a lot of people don't really realize, but you can tell us like when we're doing things wrong, whether it's about gender stuff or whether it's about like, we're not actually getting to the stuff I wanna work on. Um, and we want to hear that, like we want to serve you the best that we can. And so with therapists and I think other health professionals as well is, is speak up if we're, if we're off track um, and, and we're there to, to kind of work with you on that. And then I think as well, if you speak up and you're not still not getting what you need, don't be afraid to then be like, I'm done, right? And, and move on to the next person. Um, and sometimes that, that's how it is that the, and it's not always because the provider is, is bad. Sometimes it's just that they're not a good fit, right? And so, it, and I think that's especially true with mental health care that, I, you know, I can't serve every client and be the best therapist for every client, right? And so that's why there's different therapists with different approaches and different um, kind of points of view. And so I think that don't be afraid to keep trying. I think that it can be really frustrating and that can be hard, um, but that's one way to advocate yourself is not give up and, and to keep trying. I think that holds true from the medical end as well. Um, I do my very best to, to try and meet my patients where their goals are and use that as a starting point, but I am not perfect just like anybody else. And I never mind being corrected or having someone bring attention to something and say, maybe if you could do this a different way, or I had a problem with the front desk to check in. Um, if I always encourage people for who visit our clinic for any reason, if there's, if there's trouble before you get to see me, if we have anything in our system that we could do better, I really like to hear about those things um, because usually I never know about it unless somebody tells me and it, it might be something outside of the visit in the room um, in I think something for, for campus health, we're continually trying to improve our, our patient experience across the board. And we're very, very open to getting feedback, positive or negative. We just like to hear what's going on. So please tell us. I'm just gonna make an addendum to some of the things y'all said already. Um, I think I think we need to like make it as easy and accessible as possible for people to provide that feedback. Like, and you know, I mean, even as a as, so, and I'm not to throw Oshner under the bus whatsoever, but you know, as a patient of Oshner, they're a large system. It's really hard to get somebody on the phone to tell them what's going on. And as a trans person who is trying to, who is coming from a vulnerable place already and having maybe experienced medical trauma to like then explain to some random person on the phone who has no idea <laughs> like about anything trans at all. And like, you're like explaining this over and over and over again to finally get to somebody who may, may be able to help you. And they're, oh, here's a toll free number. You know, we just, I will like scream this until I die, but we need patient navigators. We absolutely need patient navigators in everything we do. Like there needs to be a point person, a person, not like a toll free number 
like not like a, a voicemail, like a person that people can come to and say, I had this experience, can you elevate it for me? And then we have to like, um, you know, offer people space to be anonymous. We have to like not expect that people are going to re-traumatize themselves in, in giving, giving this feedback. Um, and we also have to have methods of accountability for when we do receive feedback, how we're going to come back and say, we've made these changes, we've implemented these things that you've said, and like, we're going to do better. And we actually have to do better when we say we're going to do better. Um, so patient navigators. No, I think patient navigators are great for advocacy. And, and I think that's a huge part in helping having someone who's not the physician that you can check in with. You know, the physicians aren't always going to be accessible, but someone that you can call directly. And, and so I think certainly the initial experience getting into a big system like this can be very daunting as you're talking to, to different schedulers on the phone who might have limited knowledge. And, and so certainly as things like that come up, I hope you all feel comfortable reaching out to me because our pride org does take it that very as a personal mission to to work with our chief diversity officer Deborah Grimes to help provide training for point um, pressure points like that. So um, I'm sorry that's been your experience before. Um, I think on the patient self advocacy self advocacy side, it's a shame that so much of it does fall onto the patient. I think the more that we can make these spaces that are affirming visible so that there's direct numbers to call and you kind of have an advertised physician who works with your needs. But that's not always the case. And, and it does unfortunately take a lot of research in advance to try and see whether or not someone you're gonna go see does have that experience or, or will be able to see you. And so, you know, there's resources such as being able to look on the healthcare quality index to see how, how your physician or how that group ranks in, in, in that care. And then there's also the ability to um, kind of read reviews online and kind of see what people have said. But when you go to the visit, I think the most important thing is just does your doctor get you? I mean, pay attention to how they ask their questions. Do they actually listen to you? Um, specifically about your sexual and social health, are they aware of the types of things that you might want to talk about? Um, are they open to you bringing up things that they weren't prepared to talk about? And how do they respond? Do they get uncomfortable? Do they ask questions? Do they acknowledge where they don't know something? Um, and it's always okay to go back for another opinion to someone else afterwards. So um, it can be really challenging, but I think the most we can do to help facilitate that, the better. And if I can, again, not a panelist, but am an advocate, um, there, are, there are also kind of just things, uh, Danny kind of mentioned this, like when you're already under stress, you already are concerned about the way you're gonna be treated walking into a situation, we, we kind of have stress responses that can make it also hard to self-advocate. Um, so things like before you even walk into the room, writing down like questions that you have, things that you wanna talk about, your like the no-goes that you're absolutely don't wanna compromise on um, so that you're not asking your brain to do that work and to kind of navigate the situation at the same time. I also really encourage, um, I believe it was Danny mentioned and I'm sorry if it wasn't bringing somebody with you, but also if that's not an option, consider recording the conversation um, so that you can go back and kind of re-listen to what happened. You can think through that. Um, and then just really, really seconding, like you cannot, you are not responsible for a provider treating you poorly. Um, so within the like means that you have available to you, it's okay to, to fire your provider, go to a new provider. you know. Like they're not doing for you what you need to do and you are well within um, your right and purview to find another provider and, and kind of never talk to them again. And I really encourage you to do that um, if you have been harmed or mistreated by a provider to not give them the chance to do that again. Um, and there are people on campus and also providers that can help say, okay, that's not the person you wanna see. Let me see if I can find a list for you. Um, and I'm one of those, I know PD is one of those, but there's also providers um, on, on this panel that I have offered um, to be that kind of resource as well. So I hope that you do know that you don't have to figure that out by yourself. Um, Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> um, I actually, I realized that that's probably my cue to wrap things up. So first, if we could thank Theo for their amazing moderation. Um, we really appreciate you. Thank you so much. Um, 
And thank you to each of our providers for being here. We we realize how complicated your schedules are, how hard it is to kind of find, especially in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and so we deeply appreciate you and just want to say thank you so much. Um, and the kind of the last thing that I will say is that we did in preparation um, for this event, put together a resource list of local resources. Um, there's the names of all of the providers and where they're stationed on this list so that you don't have to take those notes. But there's also just additional um, details about mental health providers and medical providers that are local um, that have been vetted and recommended. And so you can go ahead and navigate that list if you would like. Um, but besides that, we would just like to really thank everybody for attending. Thank you for um, the audience who has attended. We really appreciate you and thank you for all of your questions. And without further ado, I will just say um, thank you so much and have a great rest of your day. Yeah, and we will, um, we have recorded this program. So I will send out the link to the recording of this to all the panelists, um, as well as it'll be on our Trans at TU web resource for uh, future incoming and current students to watch. They can learn more about what um, QT healthcare access they have in the city as they come in. So I know we have a large present current in real virtual Zoom right now, uh, but this really great group of folks, um, hopefully y'all also got to get connected and this will be a resource that lives on transit to you. Thank you. Take care, y'all. Thank you, everyone. Bye, thank you.